Hello, and welcome to another fully live Friday episode of Hacking with Friends. My name is Cody Kinsey. I am a security researcher at Veronis, and today, as usual, we have my good friend and fellow hacker Alex on to help us go through all the cybersecurity news. Alex, how are you doing today? Pretty good, but also tired. <laughs> <laughs> per usual. How about you? Uh, pretty good. I actually got a good night of sleep, and I have stopped staying up till 6 a.m. working on Damn. my QR code project, which we'll go into in just a little bit. But we had a pretty exciting week. We also, um, the, the days are flying by. Did we do the stream with MG this week? Was that this that week? That was two days ago. It seems yeah. like a week ago. So yeah. if you joined us on the last fully live stream, we had MG, the creator of the OMG cable on, and we talked about all sorts of cool things about the new OMG plug he came out with, the SEO war he got into with, uh, let's just say, another company in order to be able to sell that product online and have people find it. And uh, just the whole experience of creating hardware and what it's like for some of the guys at Hack5 who are making new products. And Darren was on as well, kind of talking about some of the new releases and payloads. So it was really, really fun. If you didn't catch it, then make sure to check it out either on the Security Forward channel or on the Hack5 channel. And make sure to join us again on Tuesday when we uh, do it next week because it was a lot of fun. We had like hundreds of people in the chat. It got a little crazy, but everybody had super great questions. So <clears throat> if you have a question you want included on that stream, make sure to leave it because we go through and check the comments on YouTube every week and we try to answer all the questions that we see <clears throat> see there that are not illegal. Um, so uh, yeah, there's a lot of news to go through this week. Um, we have some of our own personal research that I'd like to go through at the top. And um, Alex, what have you been working on this week? More nugget stuff per usual, some of which I did showcase on the last stream, <laughs> but... Um, I just started working on the new web interface for the rubber nugget, so hopefully you'll be able to deploy um, DuckyScript payloads from a web browser and be able to edit and run them live, in addition to also being able to use the onboard buttons and screen to deploy DuckyScript payloads. Hmm. Yeah, that's mostly <clears throat> what I've been up to. So the web interface uh, being like, you can plug this into a computer, you can connect to this web interface on your phone and then run whatever DuckyScript you want, or even compose new payloads? Yeah. Pretty useful. There's only four buttons on the Wi-Fi Nugget, so it would be pretty painful to try to type out a Ducky script payload. But my Great. still my favorite feature you've implemented is making it so you can see which part of the payload is running on the screen of the Wi-Fi Nugget Ooh, yeah. while you're actually inducting uh, Ducky script. There's no other thing from Hack5 that has a screen. It's all very low key and kind of discreet. So if you're a developer, you're working on a, a payload, it's really actually super cool to be able to see where in the script something might be going wrong on the screen. I've never, I never thought that I wanted that before, but then as soon as I saw that, I was like, I really want that and I like it. So that's yeah. kind of what I'm looking forward to. Yeah, that's the thing. Hopefully I can do a demo on that soon, but I also found that feature very useful because with most Hack5 products, they'll have like an LED indicator or some other kind of obscure way of like gauging the progress of a payload where you can set like different LED colors to like indicate part of the attack status or whatever. Um, but with the Wi-Fi Nugget, you can actually use the screen to like see upcoming commands and also visualize them. Um, I used different cat graphics to indicate like different commands that are running, like a string injection, delay or stuff like that, in addition to also flashing the LED and displaying the command on screen. Mm, so um, in the chat also, uh, Aphet Oni asked, what am I drinking today? This is Klub uh, This I first had this at the C3 conference in Germany and it is very expensive to find and I haven't been able to find it anywhere. But now that we're back in Los Angeles, I can pay $100 for a case of it. And I did because it's great. Um, and it's just a, a very caffeinated um, kind of like tea carbonated beverage. It's it's really good. It's really good. It's an acquired taste. But um, also uh, we have someone from France. Bonjour. Um, so on my screen, uh, if you want to see the work I've been doing on QR codes, it's kind of I've been really interested in how QR codes work because uh, as the pandemic set in, so many restaurants started using QR codes for their menus and all sorts of other interesting purposes, and I just started seeing them everywhere. So I've been doing some research into whether or not you can create optical collisions or QR codes that look ex that are extremely similar, where you could just take a pen and kind of modify one into the other, but it would actually go to a different domain. So I took about 1,200 very, very similar domains to a target domain, which was rhackhat.com, H-A-K-C-A-T.com. And I was able to see that by running it through, um, there was a 23% difference, and this is a, a difference image. So I basically compared two images, and then um, this highlighted region, the white part, is the part of those two images that are different. So by changing one letter, um, H-A-T-C-A-T, instead of H-A-T-G-A-T, 
I was able to cause a 23% difference, which is huge. Like almost a quarter of the image is totally different from just changing that single character. But if I changed a uh, different character, H-A-T-G-A-T, -A instead of H-A-T-C-A-T, -A I got this. So this is only like 6% difference. And this is still probably not something you could do with like a pen and paper. But it is interesting to see that if you examine them and really compare a bunch of them, you can find ones that are so similar that with a little bit of an overlay or just by changing some parts of it, you might actually be able to change a QR code uh, that's already printed into saying something totally different than what it was intended to say. So that's kind of my goal with this research. I ran into a jam because I tried to sign up for a VPS service so I could run a server to generate 300 million, um, basically every possible like six character domain um, and then run it through this and find which one was absolutely closest to the target uh, QR code. But um, I got flagged by Linode uh, for being a security researcher, a very, you know, uh, kind of restricted class of people, I guess. And uh, I had to explain myself and tell them exactly what I was doing. And the whole thing took so long that I'd already moved on to a different like part of the project by the time they got back to me. I'm like, okay, you can generate QR codes. It took like two days. Um, so anyway, uh, I had a little bit of a snag at this part, but then I got interested in a different part of QR codes, which is 3D printing them. So right here is a 3D printed stencil uh, for a QR code. And this is quite a complicated QR code. And this actually scans. Now it doesn't scan great. And Alex was able to scan it last night and it, it did in fact work. And this encodes for um, the names of all of the hackers who were part of my student club at Pasadena City College. So all of us um, kind of have our own little hacker names. And this is not only a little story about like how we all met, but then like a little like shout out to each one of those people. And um, this is designed to be put on, you know, a piece of paper or something, as you can see on my screen here and spray painted over or otherwise just marked over. You can also use it as a stamp if you wanted to and uh, meant to create a QR code that's scannable. Now this one um, didn't, didn't exactly uh, get enough defi definition to scan properly. And I've, I've had a pretty difficult time getting these more complex ones to scan. However, um, it is a really cool thing to do with a 3D printer uh, to be able to take this. And this one, uh, so what's interesting is, again, this one actually scans. If you put this on like a light table or something like that and you actually capture this, Alex was able to scan this and decode the information that's saved in this like physical object. So of course, is this as efficient as just like writing it down? Like, no, it's not. And it's pretty difficult. I had to run this through a bunch of different things. Uh, there's a free online tool that allows you to take a SVG file and turn it into something for a laser cutter, but I don't have a laser cutter. So I had to instead change it into a 3D like printable image. So this took some time, but the point of the program was to correct any islands that normally would fall out because they're not connected to anything. So as you can see, these corners are very delicate because we can't actually make them like the, the open space they're supposed to be, we have to use like stenciling in order to kind of fill them in. So this was a really cool and interesting project. And I did manage to get some, uh, some QR codes that scan super, super well. So I can't um, put them on the stream because they encode for uh, things that I probably don't want you decoding for uh, in our just test example. Um, but I will put some up uh, on my Twitter if you're interested in this sort of thing. Um, creating 3D printable QR code stencils is actually super fun because you see them everywhere. Uh, we see QR codes everywhere and people are curious about QR codes. So if you want to trick someone into scanning something and reading a message or going to a URL, QR codes are kind of where it's at. And these stencils are actually not that hard to make and they were super fun. So that's my personal research I've been working on this week. Um, again, super fun and interesting QR codes, uh, ubiquitous, we see them everywhere and not a lot of people understand how they work. So. This one, uh, this one will scan, and I'm going to be still working on making more complex ones that are able to uh, be printed maybe a little bit better. I was wondering with the difference image, which was pretty cool, if you could compensate for error correction, because like with QR codes, you can destroy like up to like 30% of them and they'll still work. Mm -hmm. I was wondering like for the difference one, since that would give you like the exact QR code for like a different URL, how much of that you could just like completely excise so you have to like fill in even less, and then it like automatically corrects itself <clears> to <throat> the correct URL. That might be a possibility. Well, cool. if I was going to build a program for this, what I would do is I would have something that like begins to convert one image to the second image. 
So starts like aggressively trying to convert, like flip mm. it basically, and then have another program that reads the QR code and and basically read at what transition boundary does oh. it flip yeah. from reading yeah. as hackcat.com to hackgat.com. Yeah. And then like find basically the, the break point between those two images. That's what I'm really interested in finding. So, I mean, that's a good idea. Like yeah. maybe we should, maybe after our nugget stuff, we should work on that. But yeah, kind of my, my idea is that you could solve for like the minimum damage you could do to a QR code to make it still readable, but actually flip to a different QR code. So by some of that could be just by damaging portions of the error correction to make it more vulnerable to that flipping process. Lots of fun stuff. Again, like we, we do a lot of just independent research so we can continually add new things to the community. I'd like to touch on it at the top of the hour. So you ready to get started with the news? Yeah, in other maker news actually, you've been working on 3D printing bird feeders and I'm pretty sure I just heard the bird feeder be attacked by a squirrel. Did you, did you hear it drop? Yeah. <laughs> no, okay, so I've been in an arms race with a squirrel for the last week and I've 3D printed a bird feeder that then has been chewed through by this incredibly aggressive um, red fox squirrel. Uh, so this thing is the size of like a house cat and can climb and jump 15 feet straight up. So I've never met an adversary like this before. And we we went to Home Depot and got like a metal like a metal cord and then an armor plate that sits on top of it to prevent the squirrel from getting in. But this is the largest, smartest animal I've ever come up against in combat uh, for a while. And I can hear it currently ripping apart yeah. the armor plate. So we're gonna have an update on my fight against a squirrel as well, uh, because it is it is like nothing I've ever done, and I'm taking suggestions to defeat this thing. If you've won against a squirrel this large before, I'm a little intimidated, honestly, by the resourcefulness of this thing. Um, but wow, yeah. uh, thank you, thank you for bringing that. I'm a little dismayed now. Yeah, it's disappointing. All right, so if we switch over to my screen, uh, I like to go over resources uh, that are really really excellent for beginners, and today I think that my favorite one I've seen this week is this video uh, by Rachel Toback. So Rachel Toback has made a lot of different appearances on shows where she will kind of just hack someone and then show them how she did it. And she's excellent at social engineering. It's probably the best thing that she does. Um, so uh, this is a video on how she got permission to hack this guy who is extremely rich um, and the CEO of, uh, I forget, DreamWorks, yeah. And she goes in and social, and I'm not gonna ruin all of it, but she social engineers him in a way where at the end when she's like, yeah, we got all your stuff, he's just he just like doesn't believe it. And he's like, no, my friend called me and it was his voice. She's like, no, it was me. And he's like, no, it wasn't. And he's like, then why do I have all your stuff? Nice. <laughs> so it's like one of those moments where like somebody who just like doesn't believe it is confronted with overwhelming evidence that they weren't as careful as they thought they were. This is an amazing video for like convincing people that it's not as simple as you think to be safe online. You know, the amount of information that's out there about you makes it relatively easy to find contacts or other reasons to contact you and data breaches. Uh, make it really easy for people to find information that could convince you that maybe you've worked with that person before uh, in a professional context. Like maybe that's a business you've worked with before. Uh, in the case of some of these really big breaches like the Equifax breach a while ago that uh, potentially leaked out lo every company you've ever worked with in your credit report. So this makes a lot of people more vulnerable than they think to these sorts of social engineering attacks using something like a simple voice changer. So if you want to see just an absolutely amazing uh, social engineering attack against a guy with a lot to lose, check out this video. I retweeted it earlier, but you can also just go to Rachel Toback's uh, Twitter at Rachel Toback. Oh, look at that. Another person who uses just her first name and last name as their Twitter handle. That's condescending of you. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm just the only one I know that does that. So I'm always <laughs> looking for, you know, uh, but anyway, yeah. Uh, this, Wait, well, whatever. Isn't your Twitter handle at Cody Kinsey? Yeah, it is. That's what I'm yeah. saying. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we're on the same team. Okay. Yeah, I no, see. I'm saying that, like, she's got the oh, right you're, idea. You're calling me out for um, not having a hacker name yet. Oh, I mean, but also that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, so no, yeah, also, yeah. Um, we're looking for a hacker name for Alex. So if you've got suggestions for hacker names for Alex, please drop them in the chat. Honestly, like <laughs> uh, hacker names that are given to you rather than the hacker names that you pick are, are the best ones. And I know that because the hacker name Alex has picked for himself is terrible hey. and we can't even say it on the stream. So yeah, we can, I'm gonna say it right now. <laughs> no. so, if you're lo so if you have a good suggestion for Alex's hacker name, please drop it in the stream. We would love to, to have some ones that he can adopt. Um, but anyway, this is my top resource of the week. I really, really like it. And I think that Rachel did an amazing job of demonstrating for beginners how these sorts of social engineering attacks work. Um, okay. Alex, you want to explain this? Yeah, we were taking a stroll through downtown Los Angeles and I just saw this Ethernet cable flip flapping in the wind. Yep. Um, and it seemed to be connected to a camera outside. Not or just something. one camera. 
two two oh dang security i didn't cameras. see that all right yeah but um i wonder what happens if we plug into it and we just might do that yeah, if it was me, it would just be connected to, like, an extremely high-voltage line and just immediately <laughs> destroy any computer yeah. that tried to plug into it. Power over Ethernet. Except, yeah, um, POE, but... but power like, surge over Ethernet. DC POE. <laughs> <laughs> How about AC POE? Okay, Alternating yeah. Alternating current. Yeah, that could... That would, that would not be fun. Um, okay, well, I don't... I don't know what we're going to do about this, but I know I'm not going to connect my own computer to it. So You can uh, hear that squirrel. Yeah, it's rattling. Tearing the, through the bottle. Yeah. It's great. It's savage. All right. Um, all right, all right. So uh, let's go ahead and start talking about some news outside of our house. Yeah. Uh, so this is something that I saw uh, that came up in just a lot of Twitter posts and people being upset. There was briefly a blockage for anybody in a certain area that was under sanction um, for any sort of payments from programs like HackerOne. So if you turned in any work, they would automatically donate it to like UNICEF or something. So that was pissing off some like Belarusian developers because you know they are finding bugs that are valid, they're submitting them, and then their money is getting sent to someone else. And obviously that sucks for them, but the, there's no real way for these companies to pay them now that like Belarus and, and Russia have been sanctioned. But the problem was, for some reason, uh, there was also hackers in Ukraine who were no longer able to raise money by doing their work. So they were effectively able to work remotely, but not able to be paid. And this was a problem that was amplified by all the infrastructure outages and their kind of like difficulty with getting in communication with these bug bounty platforms to get the situation resolved. So this has finally been resolved, I'm happy to see. And Hacker One has apologized, or sorry, Hackeroni has apologized for this. Uh, but I did see a lot of traffic on Twitter that was um, you know, like this, that was really getting a lot of attention for uh, all these Ukrainian developers not being able to get paid for all the hard work that they've done. So um, just kind of kind of notable, and I'm glad that they stepped in and fixed this because it was getting a lot of attention on Twitter, and um, a lot of Ukrainians were getting pretty validly upset. All right, Alex, what have you got this week? Uh, so one of the most oppressed communities has been hit yet again. Oh, um, no gamers? The gaming community. Ah. Uh. Um, seems that Lapsus dollar sign has made it back into the news again. Um, this time they did something against Ubisoft, who also does something vaguely related to games that I don't know too much about. Um, it doesn't seem that there was any sort of data breach or anything like that, but they just said they encountered a cybersecurity incident sometime last week. And as a precautionary thing, they reset all their um, user all their staff passwords and stuff like that. Nothing seems to have been affected or um, obtained by the hackers, but it seems to be related to Lapsus dollar sign. Um, <laughs> and here you can see in one of their internal chats, they just responded to news on the attack with a smirk emoji. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> Wait, wait, but who did? The... the Lapsus group. Oh, okay. They just, all right, all right. Um, so I thought it doesn't the seem like responded. No. <laughs> doesn't seem like anything too serious happened, but it's just interesting to see the groups that this group... It's interesting to see the companies that this group is choosing to go after. Yeah, so it's... You know, are... first they were attacking NVIDIA because they wanted um, like to do, like, stuff. crypto mining and stuff like that. Yeah, and to yeah. disclose, like, the source code for, like, NVIDIA drivers... Then Samsung and then now Ubisoft. So they seem. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, but it's just like they seem like like an infighting group, a group of like crypto bros, kind of. Yeah. Where like they they also during the previous attack with Nvidia um, had posted something complaining about internal struggles, where they're like, some of our members are making unreasonable demands on Nvidia and making us look bad, and it's taking longer for us to do our job because of this. And they had like a big old like public argument about it. So like this group uh, seems like they have the technical capability of like executing you know crimes, but also has some internal management issues right. that are per, that are causing it to make some in some in some cases kind of bizarre uh, demands or demands that just really aren't likely to be ever met. Which is kind of the point of having one of these groups is is making a demand and having it met. So this group seems to be in a little bit of a struggle in, like in terms of management, but they are continually kind of targeting companies around that space of like video gaming and um, cryptocurrency mining so two of the most oppressed two of the most oppressed after. groups yeah yeah it really sucks for them wow all right so uh over on my screen um we have an interesting case that has gone this has been the struggle since the dawn of the internet how do you pirate content and depending on your answer the uh industry that has the most to lose from that is going to find a way to go after you 
of course, uh, these film studios have a long history of going after the sharing communities or the internet providers, and this battle has continued on just continually since files have been shared. So originally they were able to go after things like, um, what's the earliest file sharing thing you, you remember? Uh, LimeWire. Sure, yeah. There you go, like Lime or whatever, you know, or other providers that would kind of aggregate this content and make it easy to access. So they had a pretty easy target and they would go after them. Next, these became decentralized and you would just find the torrent on the internet and then use a torrent tracker in order to find and download it. Well, that's when you started getting notices from your internet service provider telling you that you had downloaded some, and of course, none of you have ever gotten this. So I'm just telling you what I heard from a friend. But this friend says that they got, you know, a notice saying that they had downloaded a torrent that contained copyrighted information and they needed to stop doing that. And that's because a lot of these film studios would go out and um, allow these kind of uh, tagged videos to be put out where if you open a torrent tracker and you have one of these in there, it will automatically beacon out and let them know from your IP address that you have this. And then they automatically send a notice to your internet service provider. And they have like a semi okay way of finding people who don't try very hard to you know obfuscate what they're doing. But smart people do what, Alex, when they're down downloading a torrent? They use their neighbor's Wi-Fi. That's not, no. All right. They um... use... <laughs> a VPN. Yeah, VPN. Thank you yes. very much, Alex. And uh, that, yes, uh, they use a VPN. So now it looks like these VPN companies are pretty easy targets for these film studios, especially ones that claim to not have logs. And because they don't have logs, there's no way of really replying to these requests that would normally result in you getting a notice from your internet service provider. So these companies have now become the victims of lawsuits from the film industry. And this is really interesting because, again, this battle has been going on forever, but TorGuard VPN has been the latest victim in this, and their response has been to block torrents uh, using a firewall. So that means that you can't use it to download uh, torrents. Like, if you're using this VPN for that, it is now useless for it. So they have basically had to do this in order to just stop the bleeding on all the money they were losing from this lawsuit. Because suddenly, if people are primarily using this, and again, a lot of these VPN companies will advertise this as something that you can do or should do um, as a privacy feature. But you know that privacy also means that they're kind of the, the last one left touching the data when it comes to this torrent being downloaded. So again, a lot of these are also kind of poisoned torrents that deliberately have trackers put into them that make it really easy for them to find the IP address that's downloaded them once you're sharing it upstream. So uh, it's it's just kind of an interesting battle that's evolved onto VPN companies and made them the most vulnerable chain in the link, especially if they're advertising no logging, because then theoretically they can't give up the person that's doing the file sharing, and that makes them kind of the, the person left holding the bag. So I didn't really think of VPN companies as being super vulnerable to these sorts of lawsuits, but in fact, they actually are. So it's a pretty interesting look into the way that VPN companies are forced to give up data or, or to limit their services. And in this case, it looks like that is actually done defensively in order to prevent the people who are you know, doing the file sharing from being unmasked by you know, being forced to start keeping logs or something like that. So I don't know exactly how I feel about this, but I, I do know that I would prefer my VPN uh, company block access to something that would track me, um, like, or very, very likely track me, than, you know, just like start doing logs secretly and sell the data so they don't get in trouble. So I guess this is a more straightforward and transparent approach, but it still kind of sucks for people who might have you know, initially bought the service thinking it might be useful for torrenting or that there weren't any sort of traffic filtering uh, or like, you know, anti net neutrality things uh, implemented into it. All right, over to you, Alex. Cool. So an NPM package was sabotaged. Um, and this is being dubbed as protest wear. I think the first instance we saw of this was with like the whole colors and faker JS thing a couple months ago, where someone basically deleted um, an open source library that they made because they were like pissed off that they weren't being paid by like high profile companies that were using it. Um, but the this interesting like advent of what's called protest wear now is um, also being used um, in this case to protest against the Russia and Ukraine war. Um, so essentially this um, developer poisoned this NPM package they created called Node IPC, targeting specifically IP addresses in, um, I think Russia and Belarus. Yeah, you can see here it deletes files on 
um, systems in Russia and Belarus that are using this open source library. But that's also pissed off some other developers that are using this that are apparently stationed, um, I think, in Russia or Belarus. <laughs> like, there's an NGO group, an American NGO group, that was stationed in one of the two countries that was using this um, software um, that was affected by this. And they had, like, some open source intelligence and, like, some files that they gathered and stuff like that that was deleted, um, resultant of this sabotage. But you can see there's also some other prominent um, libraries like Vue.js, which is a open source front end framework um, that was affected. But yeah, there's a little bit of uproar against um, <laughs> this direct sabotage on open source software. Was this, wait, I, maybe I wasn't paying attention, but was this done by the authors or by an unauthorized party? I think it was done by the authors. Wow. So this yeah. is, again, like protest where we're yeah. like, and it know. also downloads this um, very political message to the user's um, desktop after they install the latest version. So people are also asking um, other frameworks like Vue that are based off this, um, what's it called? I think Node, Node IPC software mm. to roll back to like earlier versions that are not affected by this change. Yikes. Oh, also somebody called out Napster. I, for I forgot about Napster. Oh, That's the OG for like getting sued by like recording companies. Um, and then somebody else points out that their friend got a takedown notice for the SpongeBob movie, uh, <laughs> nice. letting them know that they would be cut from the internet if they continue this deviant behavior. That's so sad <laughs> to get like such a scary legal notice like for the SpongeBob movie. It must have scared them SpongeBob so SpongeBob should be public domain. That, that okay, stuff, that's, that's a that's... radical opinion. No. That is not the opinion of me. It's an important piece of culture that everyone should have free access to. I state your opinion in the chat. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so over on my screen, uh, we have something that we covered last week, actually. So we were talking about the various ways that some of these satellite terminals could have been damaged from the perspective of somebody uh, who uh, knows a fair amount about the way that these satellite terminals operate and was doing kind of an educated guess based on the available information. Now that more information has come out, you can see that it actually did kind of substantiate what we went over last week, where there was a vulnerability in these satellite terminals, and you could basically use one satellite terminal to attack others and propagate a pretty severe amount of area. Um, so this was really, really interesting because the uh, CISA and the FBI both warned, warned today that these sorts of satellite terminals are at extreme risk. So right now, because there is a conflict going on that has the potential to impact like ground lines and traditional infrastructure, satellite infrastructure is an increasingly interesting area for all different parties to look into. Now, we also talked about how Elon Musk was sending in Starlink terminals to Ukraine, and this has caused kind of an arms race between uh, uh, SpaceX, I guess, and the Russian military in trying to prevent these links from being jammed and making sure that the communication lines remain open and that people are able to access data, um, which is critical for being able to you know, survive or wage war. So uh, it's really been these satellite terminals that have been hit the most in this conflict as soon as this conflict started, because these are essential links that provide really, really critical data for lots of different things. And in fact, some of these attacks also took out uh, a bunch of windmills in Germany. Oh, sorry, 5,800 wind turbines in Germany, um, and also affected customers in France, Italy, Hungary, Greece, and Poland, which pissed a lot of people off because we rely on these sorts of satellite communications for lots of things. So one country going to war in another country, like across their border, is kind of worrying for the rest of the world when satellite communication for really critical things starts going out in giant patches across the rest of the world because of the way that this war is being waged. So it really does call into perspective that there are some very critical things that we rely on as a society that could very easily be disrupted by a single party. And in this case, we're seeing a couple different things, GPS and satellite communications being specifically targeted as some of the most critical infrastructure you can go after. So uh, you can see that the KA sat network, which the Ukrainian government heavily relied on in early parts of the war, has come under increasingly strenuous cyber attack. And this is suspected to be from Russian state actors. So what's clear here is that the second the attack kicked off, it was suddenly nearly impossible for some of these Ukrainian agencies to access the internet via their satellite links, making their, uh, their infrastructure an even easier target for Russian attacks, because it means that once you knock people off their local network, they really have no way of communicating because uh, the satellites aren't working anymore. <clears throat> so 
the uh, Viasat hack is being investigated by the U.S. government. Um, and of course, this is an extremely disruptive thing for anybody that relies on satellite links. So it's interesting here to see that there are kind of older school, more traditional satellite networks that are you know, used by lots of people, not just the military, also by civilian agencies for things like, again, like windmill monitoring. And uh, it, it's scary to note that once these sorts of conflicts get worse and worse, you can expect that these critical infrastructure are going to be the most heavily targeted areas. And, and there's been lots of infiltration attacks where people are basically laying the seeds for a further attack or a shutdown just in anticipation of a conflict maybe getting worse or starting to affect other people. So um, the, the GPS and SATCOM attacks have really been the most worrying because it's very difficult to wage a war without information and it's very difficult to know where you're going without GPS. And those are just absolutely devastating to lose in a modern society. Yeah, I didn't get to read too much into it, but I have two articles that were pulled up on um, GPS and also GNSS, which I think is the protocol that's um, Russian created. Mm -hmm. I think that's the origin of them. Um, but apparently this is screwing with some other European countries um, and their um, GPS signals used for stuff like airline navigation and stuff like that. They're being affected um, and they're essentially just warning pilots or other people that are using GPS um, that they can't entirely rely on these systems, at least in proximity to the Ukrainian or Russian borders since um, GPS spoofing has been actively detected, which is used, of course, to like disorient. Um, people that are using GPS or also to just entirely jam it. Yeah, so yeah. <clears throat> GPS spoofing technology has really come a, a, a super long ways um, over the last like decade or so. And there have been a lot of ships that have employed military style GPS spoofing in order to do things like evade sanctions. So if you want to look some of this information up, there's lots of investigative reports that have come out recently on ghost ships that mm -hmm. basically go completely rogue and start spoofing their transponder to different locations than they actually are. And these are able to evade some of the maritime tracking systems that are used. And some of them are open source and used to, you know, just monitor ships and kind of make sure that they're doing what they say they're supposed to be doing. But a lot of these ships will just totally leave their original path. And satellite monitoring has revealed that in many cases, these ships will go places that they never stayed on their logs and never actually like uh, confirm with their GPS. Instead, they stage these completely fake voyages that are all done via spoofing. And this can affect other ships as well, meaning you have a ghost ship out there going places, maybe into a crowded area where nobody can basically see them on this automated tracking system. And they could, there could be collisions, there could be other issues. So spoofing and jamming have been increasingly part of both commercial sanctions evasion and also military strategy. Because being able to disrupt and make someone think they are somewhere else where they, they really are, like one of the first strategies for Ukraine when the Russians were invading was to take down the road signs. And I imagine any sort of GPS spoofing or jamming would also make it incredibly difficult for someone who was trying to find their way around with the map and no road signs uh, to figure out where they were. So this current kind of disruption works both ways, but also spills over into lots of other conflicts. Because depending on how high up you're doing the jamming, you can be affecting either the local area or you can attack the system itself and make it completely impossible to access maybe a, an entire geographic part of the system or the entire system itself. And I would state that it's probably pretty believable to assume <clears throat> that there are some pretty severe zero day vulnerabilities in these systems that would allow an adversary, if they wanted to, to shut down the entire system or even possibly destroy it. So these sorts of zero day vulnerabilities would be devastating. Um, and highly sought after by an adversary because they would allow you to take down the only means of communicating in, an, in a contested area. So um, you're going to see more of these super, super critical areas hit and GPS jamming and spoofing is an increasingly popular way uh, of just kind of disrupting the modern ways we have of tracking objects. Yeah. All right. So um, over on my screen, you can see that it is kind of a free for all in Ukraine because it's not just Russian actors that have been hitting the Ukrainian government and Ukrainian people. It is also apparently Chinese state actors. Mm -hmm. So uh, it seems like they are kind of targeting this just because everybody is so distracted and out of position that it's easy to go after an area that is hotly contested and under a lot of attack by other people. So uh, they've kind of thrown their hat into the ring. And it's more at this point seemingly about espionage than the sorts of malicious wipers that we've seen go out 
from Russian state actors, but it's still a pretty concerning sign that, you know, the Russian invasion is an opportunity for lots of different state actors to go in and do their thing. And the Chinese government-backed actors seem to be taking advantage of the situation to get as much intelligence and as much of a foothold as possible so that they can be you know, somewhat of a part of whatever ends up happening by having foothold on infrastructure and being able to listen in on whatever happens to that infrastructure in the future. So just an interesting approach and a, also a lucky catch to be able to detect this sort of malicious activity by a known um, APT group. Hmm. Sketchy stuff. The other week they were targeting um, defense contractors in the US and some other stuff like that. Yeah. Or what they're up to. Yeah, so I um, I did a little callback to that uh, like Equifax breach a while ago, but how about a current TransUnion South Africa breach? So this is something that affects the personal data, obviously, of credit reports, and that is lots and lots of personal information about people that has been compiled painstakingly by these companies over many years. And uh, it seems that this has been an exploitation attack. So basically, the hackers were able to exfiltrate the data, and these hackers are also Brazilian. Uh, so their uh, their hacking group is known as Naughty Sec Two, uh, and they have claimed responsibility. And apparently, we're able to exfiltrate about four. Nice. I wonder that if was... they could hear that. Yeah. So uh, we're back in Los Angeles. Um, that was either a mortar celebrating a sports game or a car bomb. Either way, uh, we're fine. So uh, anyway, yeah. So they were able to exfiltrate about four terabytes of data. And this was enough to cause a lot of concern, uh, but unfortunately, uh, well, maybe not unfortunately, let's say fortunately for the company, they've decided not to negotiate and that they're just going to assume that this data is already out there. So uh, that means that a lot of these customers in South Africa can expect the, the people who are left holding the data to broker it to anybody who has a plan for making money off of it. And because they're probably not going to be using it themselves, that means you can see more sophisticated threat actors buying up this data and using it for some sort of phishing attack or some sort of other targeted attack against maybe the juiciest targets within that group. So uh, a very unfortunate state of affairs for people um, in South Africa who you know are have been kind of had having their data collected by this agency for a very long time and now have had it leaked. Um, but it is at least good that they're not assuming that just by paying the ransom, the data is not going to be breached. Because at this point, as soon as the data has been exfiltrated from the company, you really have to assume that it is going to be leaked or has already been leaked when it comes to protecting your customers and making sure that people have adequate uh, means to defend themselves. And I'm not sure if credit and monitoring really accounts for that. Um, but you know, we'll see what happens. And overall, another example of extremely sensitive personal information that was exfiltrated and uh, potentially might come back to affect these customers in the future in the form of phishing attacks. Thank you. Alex? Cool, so UPS systems can now be remotely blown up, if you're familiar with that. Uh, um, uninterruptible power supplies. I'm sorry, UPS is No, fine. no, no, yeah. However, the object of uninterruptible <laughs> power supplies. I forgot about the parcel the, service. The for parcel a while. service. I'm sorry. Let me state again. Your packages U can be blown UPS up. UPS is not going to be blown up. <laughs> it is uninterruptible power supplies, yes. which can be, um, I guess, uh, very forcibly reset. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So the actual demonstration itself is like a little bit exaggerated because they have like a UPS hooked up to a waveform generator, which I'll show you in a second. But um, a UPS manufacturer, that's an un uninterruptible power supply, which is also a tongue twister for me, manufactured by APC, which is a subsidiary of Schneider Electric, um, apparently manufactures these UPS systems that can also be connected to the internet, so you can monitor like um, if your stuff is online um, and also just control power stuff. But three vulnerabilities that are currently being tracked as um, TLS storm, um, affect these UPS systems, and here you can see what these are. Um, CVE 2022-0715 um, allows an attacker to forge a malicious firmware and install it over the network, since these UPS systems have over-the-air updates. Um, and the other ones are um, two exploits that are based off TLS, which I'm pretty sure is um, kind of an outdated um, encryption thing that's replaced by SSL. Yeah. Um, but basically, um, the attacker can authenticate as Schneider Electric Cloud um, and be able to do malicious stuff on the UPS system, like send over malicious firmware. And then there's also this third hmm. exploit here that allows them to um, remotely execute code, also using a TLS exploit. 
Um, yeah, so some of the ways that this could be attacked, you can attack it um, remotely over the internet. You can also do this on a local network or even via a USB drive. Um, but the demonstration they show here um, shows a takeover in this window over here um, using the TLS storm exploit. And you can check out more on this page. But as you can see, they have it hooked up to a waveform generator, which probably isn't common for um, wherever you'll see a UPS system deployed. But basically, they use this to send a bunch of random AC signals to the power supply. Um, it should shut it off in a second, I think. And then I believe it catches on fire, which is pretty rad. Whoa. OK, OK. Ah, uh, oh, smoke. Yeah. The, so that's like out the magic some, smoke. Right. Yeah, so hey. this also doubles as a, um, as a fog generator. That's what pretty are those cool. Called? Fog machines, yeah. Yeah, we very rarely <laughs> see uh, like an exploit that will literally blow up the computer or yeah. like whatever else it's running on. But this is, there's a computer in the uninterrupt uninterruptible power supply, and we're blowing it up. So this is actually an exploit that will blow up a computer. I I'm really <laughs> impressed by this. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, we haven't we haven't covered an actual exploit that would explode a computer in a long time. So congratulations, that's that's great. Yeah, it's kind of scary though because you can also see some of the different sectors that are affected. Um, governmental, eighty one percent of um, systems that have these UPS supplies are affected. Healthcare industrial and various other applications. Most of these UPS systems are um, important. largely affected by- Like distance, healthcare yeah. seems really important. Oh yeah, imagine yeah. someone just like blows up grandpa's um, <laughs> like heart support or whatever. Yeah, no, that's Scary. terrible. Uh, so we've got some suggestions for your hacker name. Oh, we God. have Handsomeware, which is actually this- Whoa, the, the Twitter get out of here. Is, is actually the Twitter username of somebody um, that already follows me on Twitter. <laughs> so unfortunately that's been taken, but it's a really good one. Next one, Magic Smoke. Damn. Pretty good. Right. Uh, next one, Nugget. Hey. Uh, we also have Kitty Nugget, Void Nugget, and Shell Nugget. Ah. And then just something with Nugget. Um, and then we have Rogue Nugget. And uh, I and then Cody Jr. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, they, and then somebody also suggested that explosion was an uninterruptible power supply receiving a malicious firmware update. Yeah, it perhaps. very well could have been. It very well could have been. Hey, I do like handsomeware though. <laughs> yeah. Too bad. Too bad it's taken. Yeah. That guy would fight you. Yeah. And if you are handsomeware, I see. I've remembered your screen name because it's so excellent. Um, all right, so over on my screen, we have an interesting case of uh, a totally unknown like business style that like I've never seen before. Um, this is the access broker operation business model, hmm. which I, again, have never heard of before. So when you think of a ransomware group, you probably think of a group that goes out, they fish someone, and then they you know send an exploit, and then they own that company, they negotiate for ransom, and then they get away. That's what I thought. But that's not actually how it works in a lot of cases. There's another layer of business that happens where these people will act as remote access brokers, where they will specialize in getting initial access to a company. And, and this is something that's truly spray and pray. They will go and they might do some targeting, but they will just go after lots and lots of different organizations. And then later on, figure out who would pay money to get access to that organization's internal network. So uh, this was Google that kind of like, uh, as it says, blew the lid on uh, this kind of extra layer of criminal organization. But these like kind of uh, access brokers would use zero days and other flaws to infect companies and then sell the access to this company to other ransomware groups. So imagine you're a ransomware group, you're lazy, you've got money and you wanna grow your business. So <clears throat> you wanna do as little work as possible to kind of scale things and go after more people. Well, what if there was somebody or a business you could go to who would do the actual intrusion for you, take your custom malware, put it on the target, and then kind of just step back and let you do your thing? That seems like a much easier bet than doing all the work yourself, especially if this business is kind of specialized and they've been doing this for a while. And that's exactly what happened here. There was a business, um, which the codename was Exotic Lily. And um, this was a Russian cyber crime, looks like they worked with a Russian cyber crime group known as Fin12 or Wizard Spider, hey, which is pretty cool. Um, and they had pretty normal jobs. Um, it was like, they were sending like 5,000 emails a day to as many as 650 targeted organizations. And they mostly worked 
nine to five hours. So worked a fairly typical nine to five uh, job with very little activity during the weekends. So uh, this is just fascinating because it goes to show there's a whole criminal ecosystem and there's a whole like criminal uh, like extra layer of business where these people will kind of take care of the hardest part of breaking into a company for you. And then provided you have functioning malware that does the rest, you just give it to them and they will upload it to your target. Pretty crazy because it means that you no longer need to do the work yourself. And these sorts of criminal organizations that just want to do ransomware can scale very quickly by just paying a third party to do what they specialize in. So if you weren't aware of this whole other kind of segment of uh, the criminal market when it comes to ransomware, I wasn't either, but this was a super interesting look into the way that these organizations scale themselves and are able to hit so many organizations so quickly. It's because they can just buy access in some cases from these other brokers who specialize in that sort of thing. So, I mean, if you're good at writing ransomware and doing the negotiations, maybe you should just you know stay in your lane and let other people who are better at the intrusion do that and just pay them out of your profits. And that seems to be the relationship that's developed between these two different segments of the ransomware industry. So, uh, yeah, a lot more nuanced than I thought it would be. Kind of interesting to note. Thing. Yeah. Alex? Cool. Have you ever heard of QNAP? I have. They're, they're oh, back no. in the news again. Oh, no. <laughs> it's another vulnerability. Oh, Dang. boy. All right. Yeah, yeah, so this initially started when QNAP just, like, told all of... They're a network-attached network attached storage service, um, but they, like, initially told their users to pull all their devices offline when they were attacked um, a couple months ago. Um, and subsequently found vulnerable to like a whole bunch of um, exploits that came out, I think, like including Log4j and some other big ones. Um, but they were now found vulnerable to one of the most recent um, Linux vulnerabilities, which is the dirty pipe. Oh, yeah. Vulnerability. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so basically that's really bad um, <laughs> <laughs> because this allows attackers to gain root privileges and also screw around with internal files and stuff like that. And of course, with a network attached storage device, um, that could possibly expose whatever internal data you don't want to have some rando to have access to. Mm. So yeah, that's pretty much the gist of it. They're found vulnerable to this exploit. Um, and currently there is no known mitigation for this vulnerability. So they just recommend users to check back and install security updates as soon as they become available, ah, which right. is real helpful. So they're just like, unplug it again yeah. and wait. <laughs> Yet again. Man, that sucks. It, it, it's really hard to have some of these IoT devices always on and always connected because yeah. it just means they're such easy, easy targets to be hit anytime there's a new vulnerability. And of course, these are used for all sorts of important things. So the likelihood that a ransomware attack would actually be paid is probably pretty high when hitting devices that are specifically meant to store large amounts of sensitive data. Right. So yikes. Not, yeah, that's a big yikes. <laughs> yeah. All right. So over on my screen, I think we have probably the last news item uh, I have for today. Do you have any more? Uh, I think I have one or two more. Oh, cool, cool. All yeah. right. So the Ukrainian Secret Service arrested a hacker who was accused of doing some pretty interesting things for um, helping the Russian troops who have invaded the country. So uh, when you're attempting to establish communications in a country that uh, is currently under attack and maybe your military stuff is being jammed, uh, then in fact, it, it can be pretty difficult to establish secure communications or even communications at all unless you have someone domestically who's helping you kind of pop up on the other side and evade any sort of firewalls or blocking that might be happening. So in this case, it looked like this hacker was willing to route calls for the Russian military mm -hmm. and do other sorts of passing of logistical information, was basically acting as a logistics and communications center for the Russian military uh, in Ukraine. Um, and again, this is pretty bad because up to a thousand calls were made through this hacker in one day um, from top leadership to members of the military because they couldn't get through on normal lines. Now, this was um, also probably the source of some of the leaks of Russian audio that I heard um, leaked on Twitter and other, and other places where Ukrainians had been able to intercept insecure communications because the people who were calling back desperately for information were not able to establish secure, secure communications in the field, either because their equipment had been destroyed, jammed, or otherwise it was inoperable. So they were having to fall back on these sorts of emergency means of communication, which were apparently being facilitated by internal collaborators who were using local networks to route malicious enemy, well, I guess just enemy calls back to their communication center. So this was obviously pretty critical to this effort to be able to route these calls and get around other limitations in communications. So this guy is probably gonna get in a lot of trouble because uh, they directly were facilitating the logistics movements of an enemy army during a time of war. 
probably not a smart move. No. All right, over to you. Cool. So OpenSSL, which is an open source thing that allows you to get certificates for like websites and stuff like that, just ensuring that like your data is secure and encrypted, was found um, vulnerable to a specific type of encryption. I let me see if I can find it here. It's like some sort of ah. Uh, if you're using elliptic curve public keys, there's a function that's used in order to parse that or something like that, which is bn underscore mod square root. Um, but apparently this causes an issue where it throws itself into an infinite loop, um, basically also um, causing a, deni a denial of service. Um, and of course, there's lots of implications to um, this issue with um, SSL being vulnerable. Um, I think we talked last week about Russia like forging their own like SSL certificates mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But if this was able to be exploited, there's probably some bad things that could happen out of this. Mm. Yeah. That's pretty much all I have on that piece. All right. Yeah, that's, that's all I've got. <laughs> so, all right, if that's all the stories you've got, then I guess that's all the news we have for today. Ending well, like eight minutes early. But, uh, you know, it's just so much going on with Russia and so much going on with Ukraine. It's been difficult to kind of stay uh, up to date on all the cyber war stuff going back and forth. Hopefully we'll have another update next week, but it's just been crazy seeing the critical infrastructure being targeted and warning signs in the United States that any US-based organization that's you know providing infrastructure might be subjected to some of these sustained state-based cyber attacks. Uh, so scary time for, criti for critical infrastructure and an interesting time for seeing what one organization can, well, what one state-based state effort can do to international shipping and apparently even like windmill monitoring in Germany. So yeah, kind of scary how everything is connected and how yeah. fragile it can be in a time of war. All right, so on that extremely opt optimistic note, thank you everyone for joining us today and especially thank you for your suggestions for Alex's hacker name. I think there were some really good ones in there. Um, so uh, yeah, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you again. And make sure to check out the Q&A stream on uh, Tuesday where we're going to be going live again on Hack5 and we will have uh, lots of excellent questions to answer. So get yours in if you didn't get it answered today and we'll make sure to answer it on the next stream on Tuesday. We'll see you then. Bye.